I watched The Poseidon Adventure and its sequel, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, both for the first time. I thought about reviewing them both, either as separate reviews or as one combined video, and then I thought, The Poseidon Adventure is a well-known disaster genre classic, so I would mostly just be listing off things that were significant and well executed about it, which can be fun, and I tend to do that a lot with the films I review. But then we come to Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, a movie that most people seem to dislike. And to be completely honest, I had a great time with it. Let me be clear, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure is by no means a great movie, but that doesn't mean it's not fun. On the contrary, it's a big, goofy adventure that I think has a great premise. And the premise, if you haven't seen this gem, is that the Poseidon, the same overturned ocean liner from the first film, is still floating, albeit temporarily, at least that's what we're told. It seems capable of staying afloat for as long as our main characters are on board, even though those same smokestacks from the original movie tend to explode every 15 to 20 minutes. Lo and behold, two boats make their way to the hull. The one crew, headed by the intrepid Michael Caine, intends to plunder the ship according to the laws of salvage, while the second, led by a philanthropic doctor, <coughs> played by Telly Savalas, are headed aboard to rescue any passengers they can find. Or are they? And I love that. The idea of just using the Poseidon as the through line to link the movies and then constructing a different plot around it is really a lot of fun, even though both movies do end up following a group of survivors as they wander through the ship and making their way over, across, and below various hazards. This plot is much better than Irwin Allen's original plan, which would have apparently followed the surviving cast members from the first adventure, traveling by train in Europe, and then becoming trapped after a tunnel collapses on them during their perilous journey home. I dislike this idea in part because of the gap between the films. Beyond the Poseidon Adventure was released a long seven years after the Poseidon first became inverted. The long delay is still strange, but introducing a new cast prevents any unfavorable comparisons to how everyone looked in 1972. I suspect Ernest Borgnine and Red Buttons might not have looked quite how they did back on that fateful New Year's Eve by the time 1979 rolled around. And also, staying with the original ship allows us to revisit the same locations, some being rebuilt for this movie, and some just consisting of reused footage from the first one. Watching them so close together was fun, because as the new characters enter the Poseidon, you can go, hey, that's where Gene Hackman fell in the burning oil, or look, that's where Stella Stevens tumbled into the flames. It is a fairly morbid trip down memory lane, but still. This film was not only produced by the master of disaster, but directed by him as well. This returning to the well, or to the waterlogged ship, was probably an attempt by Irwin Allen to regain some of the momentum lost by the previous year's flop, The Swarm, which I'm dying to watch after seeing this. The Poseidon Adventure was the first monster hit for Mr. Allen, following his success in TV during the 60s, and heading back to the Poseidon at this point in his career probably seemed like a safe bet. Alas, Beyond the Poseidon Adventure was an even bigger flop, grossing around $2 million against a $10 million budget. Yikes. But forget about that for a minute. How is Irwin Allen as a director, you might be asking? Not great. The look of the movie is fairly flat much of the time, with many group shots of the cast being fairly standard, eye-level shots that would look more in keeping with an episode of Get Smart or something like that. Incidentally, that is not a slight against Get Smart, but I don't pay a visit to Maxwell Smart and Agent 99 for thrillingly staged action and suspense. But at the same time, much of it looks great. The huge set of the overturned hull of the Poseidon is very impressive, and they make sure to get as much coverage of that as possible. It does look perfectly clean and brand new for a ship that was apparently on its last voyage, but the fact they built it for real is admirable. The angle at which it's sitting is in conflict with the fact that much of the interior is depicted as being completely level, but again, that was only something I thought about afterwards. So Irwin Allen is still capable of pulling off some measure of spectacle, but what he was always adept at was pulling together an interesting, star-studded cast. Michael Caine, as I said, plays the captain of a tugboat that somehow wasn't flipped over by the tidal wave that wrecked the Poseidon. I'm a big Michael Caine fan, so I enjoyed him here. He's the guy that only cares about money until he must set aside his selfish desires to save the less skilled survivors that are put in his path. It's not a stunning character arc, but who says disaster movies need those? Carl Malden plays his buddy, billed in the credits last, and Carl Malden as Wilbur. Why the character name of Wilbur was important enough to make the poster, I'm not sure. Carl Malden has some undetermined illness, possibly terminal, but 
also able to be operated on, that causes problems intermittently once they enter the Poseidon, and then he supposedly sacrifices himself, although really we just see him swimming and then he vanishes. Michael Caine fills us in on this heroic deed, but that just isn't good enough. I was promised Carl Malden as the iconic character Wilbur, and they don't even give him a dramatic death scene. Sally Field is there as well, playing a girl that is buddies with fan favorite Wilbur. She inexplicably falls in love with Michael Caine during the stresses they live through. I know it sounds like I'm making fun of her, and that's because her character is kind of nothing, but she still is occasionally funny. Peter Boyle, now immortalized as Frank Barone of Everybody Loves Raymond, plays Ernest Borgnine. And by that I mean he stars as the loudmouth guy who questions everything the leader does, be he Gene Hackman or Michael Caine. Angela Cartwright, having successfully avoided the Nazis when she and the rest of the Von Trapps escaped over the Alps, plays his daughter. Jack Warden plays a blind author whose blindness is a hindrance when navigating an upside-down ship, but not as big a hindrance as you'd think. I did like the addition of that character, though, and he adds more suspense than Shelley Winter's constant mentions of being overweight last time. Young, fresh-faced Mark Harmon plays the heartthrob of the group, who is under more threat by protective father Peter Boyle than by the Poseidon itself. Slim Pickens' Texas shtick is way overdone as a supposed oil baron who spends much of his time protecting a wine bottle, Shirley Jones is saddled with the thankless and tiny role of the ship's nurse, and finally we come to the good doctor Spavo, as played by Telly Savalas. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by revealing he's the villain of the movie. If Telly Savalas shows up in a white suit and black shirt, standing aboard a yacht, he's a bad guy, no matter how much he tries to claim that he's only there to help. He's basically playing Blofeld from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and in the intervening ten years, they've had marvelous advancements in curing broken necks. His true identity is that of a terrorist, or something like that. He says he's not one, but he's clambering around the Poseidon looking for a crate filled with plutonium, so I'm going to hazard a guess that he's a terrorist. Telly Savalas was probably only on set for a few days as he's missing for much of the movie, but I enjoyed it. The presence of a villain in the midst of a disaster is great, even if it's been done before. It lends itself to a couple of interesting avenues that the script doesn't always take advantage of. The one is where he has one of the passengers murdered, a woman played by Veronica Hamill, who is connected to him in some unexplained way. The idea of having a mini murder mystery play out in the midst of trying to survive the whole ship trying to kill the rest of the characters is great, but by that point, Telly Savalas' true intentions are obvious to Michael Caine and the gang, so they don't spend a lot of time puzzling over who the killer is. But having a bad guy, with henchmen, mind you, does lead to one of my favorite sequences in the film, a gunfight in the cargo hold. Apparently, the Poseidon was brimming with firearms, and our heroes take on the terrorists with gusto. In all seriousness, it's not a great action scene, but let me set the stage for you. Michael Caine, Peter Boyle, and Mark Harmon all blazing away with M16s. Move over, Expendables. This is the action team-up that audiences want to see. The upside-down gimmick, if you want to call it that, doesn't affect the film as much as it did last time, like in the cargo hold, the crates all look to be in great condition considering what they went through, and the ever-rising water levels that kept Hackman, Borgnine, and company running isn't really an issue here, until it is, but there is a scene where our heroes are trapped in another area of the cargo hold where cars are suspended from the floor, now the ceiling. It's a fun visual, and an example of the various scenarios and sets that a sequel like this could have delved further into. So between the two, I can't really say that Beyond is as good as The Poseidon Adventure. Nothing in this movie can equal the suspense of something like Shelley Winters rescuing Gene Hackman underwater, or even having the characters climb up the Christmas tree near the beginning of that one. But I still found it to be a lot of fun. It might be a movie that depends on being in the right mood to enjoy it, because without a doubt, there are plenty of questions of logic and problematic scripting that are glaringly obvious, but at the end of the day, it's still a bunch of recognizable actors being put through a lot of uncomfortable situations, and I find I really enjoy seeing how a group of people with varying degrees of agility all get through the dangers they face, from something as simple as jumping across a hole in the floor, to climbing a ladder, to making their way through a flooding hallway. These scenes give a chance to examine how a variety of people would handle that, who would choose to help others, who would try to survive at any cost, and I find that really interesting to watch. So while I would recommend it, I will add the qualifying statement that it's not a classic. Maybe it's even a bad movie. I'm not sure if it's as bad as its reputation would have you believe. I still enjoyed it a great deal. If you want a truly well-made, spectacular disaster film, then The Towering Inferno, well, towers over this one. 
But if you're in the mood for a smaller scale, again, kind of goofy action film, why not check out Beyond the Poseidon Adventure? Thanks so much for watching my review. If you enjoyed it, I hope you check out some more of my reviews. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks again, and adios for now.